filter in here. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up if you can. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Wonderful. All right. Well, good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome to RJ Julia Booksellers virtual event tonight. We are so excited to have with us author Lise Wheel, who tonight will be in discussion with the fabulous Sarah DeVello. Just before we get started, I want to go over a few quick Zoom housekeeping details. Please ask questions using the chat box function of your Zoom screen. So we will get to as many of your questions as we can later in the evening. Send them on over as they come to you. Though you're going to remain muted throughout the duration of the event, we do have an RJ Julia staff member monitoring the chat box. For optimal viewing, you can use the Zoom view functions in the top right corner of your screen, and that will allow the speaking author to stay highlighted throughout the duration of the event. And of course, please don't forget to purchase your copy of Hunting the Unabomber. Signed book plates are available while supplies last. Links for book purchases from both RJ Julia booksellers and Wesley and RJ Julia will be sent to you in that Zoom chat box. Tonight, we have author Lise Wheel with us. She is a former legal analyst for Fox News and The O'Reilly Factor and has appeared regularly on Your World with Neil Cavuto, Lou Dobbs Tonight, and the I Miss Morning Shows. She has served as legal analyst and reporter for NBC News and NPR's All Things Considered. Before that, Lee served as a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office and was a tenured professor of law at the University of Washington. She appeared frequently on CN appears frequently on CN CNN as a legal analyst as well. Lise is the author of over 18 books and tonight joins us to discuss her 19th and second hunt in the hunting series, Hunting the Unabomber. In conversation this evening, we also have with us Sarah DeVello. Sarah is an acclaimed yoga teacher, national speaker, and author of the best-selling book, Where in the Ohm Am I? She is a true crime aficionado and currently writing her first mystery, also host of the video series Mighty Mystery Mondays for a Mighty Blaze. She is a social media guru and former, former publicist. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Lise and Sarah. Yay! So much, Kendra. That was great. Well, I am so excited to host the absolutely amazing Elise. Elise, you are such an incredible inspiration. Um, I have to share some of the absolutely astounding praise that your book has, has drawn. Um, you have earned a starred review from Booklist, who calls this a spellbinding account of the most complex and cop captivating manhunt in American history. They say it is a true crime masterpiece. Oh my gosh, these are words that would make any author's heart delight. They say it is a powerful dual narrative of the unfolding investigation and life story of Ted Kaczynski. The action progresses with drama and nail-biting intensity. The conclusion foregone yet nonetheless compelling it is, again, a true crime masterpiece. That praise is earned. So, please <laughs> tell us about this incredible book. Tell us. Oh, Sarah, yeah, and I didn't even know the person that wrote that review. I mean, I should have, you know, spent another $20 on, on the bribe. I mean, <laughs> I was so amazed by that. I was really thrilled. Um, yeah, Hunting the Unabomber, you know, it's a, it's a tale that's been told before. And so, you know, when I was looking into how do I, how do I tell this story about this iconic person, this wonderkin who went to Harvard at the age of 16 and taught, you know, at mathematics and was really, really this bright guy and then holed up in a cabin in Montana and then sent, sent the FBI on their longest to date manhunt in the FBI history spanning nearly 18 years and really put the country through turmoil for all those years when these bombs would go exploding and, and different cities all over the country, you know, from San Francisco to Illinois uh, to the East Coast. I mean, it, it, all these places, even on a plane. Um, how would I be able to tell the story in a different way? And I was fortunate enough to go on a little hunt of my own, a little mini hunt, if you will, being a former federal prosecutor, third generation, 
uh, by the way, I have a little bit of my own hunting techniques. And I was able to find a retired FBI agent who'd been the head of the task force, the Unabom task force in San Francisco. He's long since retired, um, on, you know, long since retired to a small idyllic town uh, and, you know, East Coast, had his wife, had his hobbies, everything. And he just, you know, 20 years have gone by and he really put in a box of the Unabomb, literally a box of Unabomber stuff away in his attic. Wow. And I found him, yeah, and he was really incensed about a documentary that had been done the summer before by Discovery, the Discovery Channel, in which they painted the FBI and how they'd gone about hunting the Unabomber. And when I found this agent, he said, you know, they got it wrong. They got so many of the things wrong. Um, about what happened in the hunt. And I said, so, you know, well, tell me some of those things. And it, mind you, I, I use kind of the federal family key, which is that I'm a daughter of an FBI agent. So being an FBI guy himself, he's not gonna just slam the phone down and not talk to me the first time. And once you kind of get in that door, you have another conversation. So it would just be rude not to talk to a, a daughter of an FBI agent, in case you're wondering how I finally got even the first call in. But once we started talking, he said, well, you know, things like they portrayed it as this one guy, pretty much, figuring out the whole thing and meeting the Unabomber afterwards, becoming friends with him, talking with him, and discover, you know, figuring out through the manifesto who it was. Mm. Well, this one guy who was on the team, you know, was helpful, and I do talk about him in the, in the book, but the guy never even met Ted Kaczynski. I mean, that's a pretty big error if, you're, if you are then watching that Discovery documentary and thinking that's the way the hunt for the Unabomber went down and that's how history happened. And there were other errors like that. And, and through talking with this agent, I said, look, I'm fascinated by this case. I'm fascinated by the hunt. I'm fascinated by this mind of Kaczynski, how he did it. Um, I'm fascinated by the things that the FBI changed per the investigation for all these years that still resonate with the FBI today. He's an iconic character that has social relevance, but I need your help. I need you to give me your sources, your, your information, that box in your attic for a start, and I, help, I need you to help me lead you to other sources, other people that were on that task force. And he did. It was amazing. So through that primary source, leading me to other primary sources, I was able to really dig in to the true hunt for the Unabomber. And that's how I started this two, two, really two year investigation and got to the real history of what happened in that, in that 18 year span. Wow, Lise, what an incredible story. I mean, every single part of that is so mind blowing, every single part of it. Um, I don't even know where to dig in. Let's start with the fact <laughs> that you are a third generation federal prosecutor. So your grandfather, your father, and you won an incredible family legacy. Your dad also um, serving as an FBI agent, which you said gave you that key beginning right. um, entree to the holder of this box in the attic. I mean, who doesn't love the idea of a box of secret information in the attic? And through your incredible um, legal expertise and the fact that you are an amazing amazing um, investigative journalist, you have for the first time revealed information to the public that has never been revealed before. What an incredible thrill. Tell us about that. Well, things, I mean, what was amazing is, you know, we think about the Unabomber investigation, and of course it was one of the most important investigations going on during that time period. I mean, you imagine people were, you know, frightened, of course, because they could open, they could, you know, open their mail and then a bomb would explode. And this is what was happening from 1978 through 1996. So you'd think it would be the biggest investigation going on. You'd think it, all the country would be focused on it. And it was for time periods, but there were lapses when he wasn't bombing. And so I, I didn't know this when I went into it, but the FBI began to view it as a dog of a case because it wasn't sexy, because it wasn't getting solved. And so agents didn't want to be put on it. And there was a lot of infighting about who was going to be put on it because they weren't, the leads weren't going anywhere. And so all that back 
kind of stabbing and infighting was going on. Interagencies were getting involved because it wasn't just the FBI. You had different jurisdictions getting involved. So all of that inter-jurisdiction stuff was going on. It was the advent of computers, ironically, because Kaczynski was railing against computerization. That was his whole thing. You know, computers are gonna kill us all and it was horrible. So you have this computer, huge computer that they were trying to set up to, you know, go through all the clues and that was failing at the same time that Kaczynski was railing against computerization. So you had those kind of ironic things going on. And then at one point, the FBI almost wanted to give up the ghost. And I, this has not been reported before, wanted to, from high up in headquarters, just shut down the whole thing, shut down the whole investigation. And was, if it had not been for my source and a couple of other agents, they would have shut down the whole Unabom investigation. They figured at one point, because he hadn't bombed for a few years, that maybe he'd done something else that was bad. I mean, you know, a Unabomber. I mean, they didn't know who it was, Kaczynski, obviously. They didn't know who it was, but whoever it was, he'd done something else. He'd robbed a bank, or, and he'd gotten caught, and so he was in another prison or he died, you know, he blown himself up. So they just wanted to stop the whole thing. And my source, Patrick Webb, um, who tragically died of cancer during the midst of this, he did not live to see this book published and he knew he was dying of cancer while he was helping me with this, which he gave this, make this gift of his time. So even more incredibly important. I mean, he literally gave me some of his last breaths of life. Um, but anyway, in, in the course of this, he and these other agents said, you cannot stop this investigation. He is still out there. He will bomb again. And in the book, I, I tell about how they strategized to get to the to top of the headquarters because, you know, they, they were in San Francisco and they did this different ploy and how they did it to keep the Unabomber investigation going on. And sure enough, about three months later, he bombed again. Wow. Oh my gosh, Lisa, that is, I mean, that is one crazy story. Um, and you share in your book that it, it, it's not only the longest, but one of the most expensive uh, manhunts in FBI history, spending not only 18 years, but costing U.S. taxpayers um, over $50 million. I mean, it's really crazy to think of the sheer scope of it. I mean, I remember growing up um, and there was this fear of Oh yeah, as you said, intermittent fear, but there was certainly a fear of, um, of when he would bomb, and then there would be a lot of anxiety around it, and a lot of anxiety around the mail or around whatever. And I remember being so fearful, um, and and it's crazy that he that one guy acting on his own, a, a brilliant guy, <laughs> could do this, could 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 mastermind. Well, it. And he and he did it. The reason he was able to keep you know to keep away from the FBI for so long is not only was he out in this lone Montana place outside of Lincoln, Montana, a very remote cabin, which he's pretty much built by hand with the help of his brother, but the, the way that he built these bombs was just through finding things in junkyards. He'd find little pieces of metal scraps and kind of that kind of thing. The batteries he would strip down. So all the components of the bombs that we got better and better at making them were so very, they became very sophisticated were actually built out of very unsophisticated things so when the FBI tried to take them and, and put the, bring them to Quantico where they would look take them to the lab to, you know to, to, to kind of look through the see what the components were try to see if they could track a component of the bomb to a particular place where it might have been manufactured uh, you know a, down to a you know a battery they couldn't so none of the components could be tracked to a place where he might have purchased them because then they could see where he might be where, you know, near where he would have purchased. They couldn't even track the components and they couldn't find another reason. They couldn't figure out a motive. You know, normally when I looked at crimes, I would look for a motive, you know, murder. What's the motive? Is it revenge? Is it sex? Is it money? You know, you, you tick through motives. They couldn't figure out a motive here. There was never a ransom. There was never any, any, and the victims were all these disparate victims. You had universities, right? Hence the Unabomber, and, and, the, and an airline. 
um, you know, fortunately when it went off, it didn't, you know, hurt anybody. The airline was able to land, but disparate kind of things. It didn't, so the, so the, the lineup of the victims didn't make sense. So the victims didn't make sense. They didn't tell a story. The motive didn't tell a story and the components of the bombs led to no clues. And of course the guy himself is out there living off the grid and you know, nobody knows him. Wow. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it is amazing from, from a surely, I, I mean, the, the way that everything you just said, it's amazing that he got away with it. It's amazing that he engineered it so carefully, every part of this, as you said, not creating a chain of motive, not creating any sort of, you know, trail of clues or, 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 right. I mean, obviously I'm not a federal prosecutor, but I watch my fair share of law and order. So I know that, you there know, you like, go, you got it. <laughs> um, so what I think is also really fascinating about this is, I know that I, um, as an author, I always feel like the story chooses you to tell it. That's how I feel. Um, and what I think is fascinating is that you are so uniquely qualified to tell the story. Again, having a JD from Harvard Law School, you're brilliant. You know, you um, are very well versed in legalese. You worked as a federal prosecutor, but then you have this investigative journalist background. Then you also have this, this key into the FBI. I mean, really only you could have told the story. So why, what attracted you to it and why now? Well, I was attracted to the subject even before I found this source, because I, I didn't know going into it, I'd find Patrick, Patrick Webb, because of kind of the things that you ticked off. I mean, here's this, here's this guy, um, Ted Kaczynski. He goes to Harvard at a very young age at 16. I went, I was older, I think I was 21, but it's still, I understood the intimidation, mm -hmm. the fact that they're feeling like you're, uh, you know, in a place maybe you don't belong, it's scary, all of that. Um, he was then subjected to, you know, experiments that, that have been very controversial. So I wondered a lot about that. Um, mm. The social relevance, you know, when I pick a subject I'm going to spend a couple of years in, I want to pick somebody that's still so socially relevant today. And he is. His manifesto is still studied today. You know, this, this diatribe against um, computerization and it's going to kill us all and it's bringing us down because we don't have any kind of connectivity. It's kind of interesting that here we are on Zoom, connecting to yeah. each other on Zoom. Um, but even, you know, we talk about Zoom bombings and, you know, we refer, refer to them as bombings, which of course they're not, aren't literally. But he, he felt like his method of, of getting to people and expressing his anger and his rage was through literal bombings. And he was so bright. I mean, this is a brilliant guy. I mean, he tested the level of, of an Einstein. So what makes a brain like that do something so horrible? And then I was fascinated, of course, by the FBI being, as that is my background as a, as a prosecutor, what was the hunt like? And what was the behind the scenes of the hunt like? Because nothing like that had been written before. And when I found the source, it was like, oh my gosh, I've got to write the, the real story of how that hunt happened. And what I didn't realize going in, what was, that was so fascinating to me as I got into it, was how some of the methodology that the FBI learned through its mistakes, by the way, Mm -hmm. in the hunt for the Unabomber, because they made a lot of mistakes, um, are some of the things that they're now implementing even today, because they've made so many mistakes in the Unabomber. I mean, they did not communicate with each other. They did not communicate with other agencies. They had a horrible time communicating with other agencies and, and getting um, evidence transferred back and forth. I mean, that was a real mess at the beginning of this investigation. And I think it really hampered, that lack of communication really hampered how fast a lot of the leads were coming through and how, and how, um, how well they were organized. So I think the FBI rightly took some real slaps for that. And I think they learned, you know, at least in what I studied and what I learned through web and the sources, that they learned a lot through the mistakes that they made. Mm. Oh, that's so fascinating. I want to go back to something that you said, which is this manifesto that he wrote, um, which they, which, you know, they're still studying. And as I understand it, ultimately that is what helped unravel this. Yes. Can you talk about that some more? Tell yes. Me. Yes. I mean, the manifesto, so the manifesto comes in fairly late in the game because this is the thing that he then writes 
And we don't know it's Ted Kaczynski at this point. We don't know that it, it could be a group of people. It could be one person. It could be a woman. We don't know who it is. But he writes and says he wants this published in the New York Times or the Washington Post. He doesn't want it in Playboy or, um, which, you know, said, we'll publish it. He says, you know, no, no, no thanks. And, but, but he, He's selective. He's an author. Totally serious. Yeah. Playboy says, we'll publish it. Um, because, of course, the Times and the Post have a real dilemma here, right? Yes. If they publish it, they are, in fact, negotiating with the terrorist. Mm. And papers, just like governments, don't want to negotiate with terrorists. And the FBI, being government, doesn't want to negotiate with terrorists. So my source got me you know, painted the scene because he was there along with the profile and he was also one of my sources, painted this amazing scene of being in the room with the head of the FBI, the head of the Washington Post at the time and the New York Times and having this really, you know, uh, emotional discussion, uh, a fever discussion about should they publish the manifesto. And going into the discussion, it was, I would say 95% sure that they would not publish the manifesto. They would not negotiate with a domestic terrorist. Mm. And it was really the profiler, uh, Kathy Puckett, who made the convincing argument. And what she said was this, he or them or it, you know, the Unabomber is saying that they'll stop with the bombing. Now, they're not saying they'll stop with the sabotage. They're keeping that as maybe we'll keep sabotaging, but you know, we'll stop killing people. But we'll stop with the bombing. We don't all have to believe that that's true mm -hmm. because we don't have to believe that the Unabomber will stop. That's granted. But what we can gain from publishing this manifesto is that someone out there will recognize something about him in this manifesto and will bring us a lead. And hey, everybody, FBI, we don't have any leads. We're sunk. And let's face it, we've done, we follow every cockamamie lead that's come on in here. I mean, I don't know if she said that word, but pretty yeah. much, I mean, that's pretty how dispirited they were at this point. And we've got nothing. Mm. So this is our best bet. And I know it's, I know it's bad, but we got to do it. And she convinced them to do it. Oh. And so wow. it was published in the Washington Post. And then, so you have this scene and I have it in the book where, you know, all these agents, it, it's published in San Francisco in the Post because it's going to be a smaller circulation. Got all these agents around the boxes there where they literally are going to be picking out, people are going to be picking up the paper and they're swarming in on different people. And of course, it's not the right guy. You know, so there's some kind of amusing scenes, if you will, um, in the book. Um, but it so it doesn't get the it doesn't get the Unabomber on that day, but it does alert Ted Kaczynski's sister-in-law, who's in Paris, and reads it, and she says to David Kaczynski's brother, you know something really, really similar in that language to your brother, who she's never met, by the way. She's never met Kaczynski. Kaczynski won't have anything to do with her, wanted to cut his brother off. They'd been very close, wanted to cut him off for the horror, the terrible violation of their trust that he would actually marry a woman and not be close as close to his brother as they had been. So mm -hmm. he didn't attend the wedding. He hates her, all this kind of stuff. So she's never met him, but she's read some of his letters, more, mostly excoriating her to, uh, to his brother, David. Wow. So let me ask you this. If, if, you, if Ted Kaczynski's, I mean, first of all, just to be in that room as a fly on the wall with the New York Times and the Washington Post and the head of the FBI and the profile, profiler trying to make this tortured decision when your policy is you don't negotiate with okay. terrorists, yeah, just right. like this guy in the door, there could be a line of others who are saying, now publish Absolutely. mine or I'll do something. You know, I mean, it's such a... Harrowing. And it's a long manifesto. I mean, it's 
it's not like three paragraphs. I mean, this is a long, and he wants it published in completion. It's a long manifesto. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sweating. Like I'm literally sitting here sweating, thinking of it. It's so stressful. If he hadn't demanded to have that published, or if the Washington Post and the New York Times had refused for the very real reason that they don't want to enable a terrorist, do you think that he would have remained uncaught or uncaught for a period of time? Okay, uh, my main guy, Agent Webb, we, we've had, we had many discussions about this, and I did with the other sources as well, and they all said that they would have gotten, that the computer source, the computer that finally then was up and running, <laughs> um, was tracking him down. They were getting closer. They were getting closer and closer in the, na in the name, just through, through a computerized search, you know, tracking, getting, and, and with Kathy's profiling, they were getting closer and closer. It would have been a matter of weeks, months, but they were getting there. It just would have taken longer. That's wow. what he says. But they were sure happy to get that manifesto. And, and, yeah. and, but even that, I mean, so they finally get, um, they finally get Ted uh, through a lawyer and a counselor to call in. And even that, the, the, the you know, call line, they're getting so many calls in after the manifesto is published that they have a tough time getting through. So that could have gone awry. I mean, there's so many things that could have gone awry there. And then there's some scenes where, you know, the mother is involved and, you know, she has a, such a difficult time believing that her son could have done something like this, which of course. So, but his brother is really a hero in my mind that he stuck with this and, and said, you know, FBI, you've got to do your job. If, I don't think it's, I don't think it's him. I do not think it's my brother, but if you've got to go and look and look at his cabin, um, then you need to look. But he didn't believe it was his brother, and, and they didn't have enough to arrest him and charge him until they actually got him out of the cabin to see that's, that was very tricky. They didn't have enough to charge him until they got him out of the cabin to see what was in the cabin. They barely got the search warrant. So it, it, it was some very tense moments there. And my, my friend, Agent Webb, was one of the guys that got him out and then was actually in the cabin and find, found the typewriter, the typewriter that wrote the manifesto, and, and then he found the explosive bomb because he was not only an FBI agent, but a bomb technician. Wow, oh my gosh, Liz, you are blowing my mind. This is crazy, this is so crazy. And this is what I love about nonfiction. This is what I love about nonfiction. As Mark Twain said, it is stranger than fiction, and it when is. you write nonfiction, you can get away with this because if you tried to write that as a novel, People might say that would never happen, but because it's a true story, you can say, oh, but it did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and questions are starting to trickle in, and I think we're going to start that at 7.35. So in five more minutes, we are, we're going to start filtering them in. I see some great questions building in the chat. I can't wait to pass them to you. Um, but Lisa, it's so great to hear your voice because, and to see you in person because you read your audio book. Um, oh, yeah. That was tell us great. about that. Yeah, tell oh us my about goodness. that. Well, um, so I haven't read many of my books because most of my books are mysteries and, you know, fiction. And so uh, I am not an actress, so <laughs> there was no way that um, the publisher could get me to do that. It's like, I can't read voices. It would be, it'd be just, I couldn't do it. And I, I leave that to the professionals. There are professionals that do that. They're wonderful. They're great. But when it came to this, I just thought, and my voice is in there. I, you know, I do it right in first person. I thought, you know, I should do this. I really should. And I thought, you know, it can't be that hard. Oh my gosh. Then you sit down in an audio room. I, I feel like I was in third grade. I couldn't, I could barely read a sentence. <laughs> um, oh my, it is hard. Um, so, but I did it. And, um, the last bit was a little tough because we were, you know, we were in shelter in place and I had what's called the pickups, you know, which are, you read the main piece, but the editor wants you to come back and read what are called pickups, which are not hiccups, but pickups, 
where there's one bay left where there are things that you need to go back and you've, mis you've mispronounced, ha ha ha, like I'm this sick of things I have to mispronounce, mispronounced or just need to read over or, you know, for whatever reason. And there was, a, you know, like three or four hours of that that I had to do. But in the time between when I read it and the time when the editor was ready for me to do the pickups, we were shelter in place. So um, it looked, we, we waited that out and it looked like at one point though, we might have to hire an actor with a studio to just scrap my thing and do it all again. Oh my God. Um, so I was, I said, you know, look, we, whatever you need to do, I understand. But we were able to um, wait the time out, get a studio, and I was able to go in just for those three hours and quickly record it, you know, touch nothing and <laughs> get out. And so I was so happy that I was able to do it. But I don't, but I'm not, I'm not professional. So those of you who have listened to it on audio, um, forgive me, I did my best. <laughs> but at least you have such a great voice. I mean, probably from your many years of being on national syndicated television as a legal expert, a legal analyst, you have such a great voice. I mean, the tone and the timbre, and it's, uh, it's very soothing and very lovely to listen to. So I just thought it was so cool that you, that you did that. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I had no idea about the pickup. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's crazy. It came within three hours of being scrapped and given to someone else. Oh, it really, after, after spending, I think, four days in a studio, um, and you just read, you just read, you know, eight, nine hours straight. Um, it doesn't sound like it's hard. I mean, it didn't sound like it would be hard for me. I mean, I just, I have my text on my iPad, and I just sit there and read. How pleasant can that be? But, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds. I, I dare you guys. <laughs> but, yeah. but I'm really happy that I did it. And again, I apologize to any of you who read it or listened to it and said, that doesn't sound very professional because it's not. <laughs> I think it sounds fantastic and very professional. I loved it. I loved hearing your voice, reading your book. Um, again, being so uniquely equipped, the universe had sort of given you everything you needed to be the person to tell the story and to be the conduit for that story. Well, it was, it was fun in some places because when I was rereading, because I hadn't looked at it for a while, when I was rereading parts and it got to like an exciting part of a hunt, or emotional part or something, I was getting excited or emotional. I mean, I really was. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself, you know. I just was like, there were a couple of places where I just had to stop or, you know, because I was getting emotional or excited or, you know, oh no, this is coming up. Or, you know, so I, that may come through in my voice and it probably did. Yay. I love it. I love it. All right. So we're going to start to segue to some questions now, but I want to announce that RJ Juliet not only has Lisa's book in stock, but has signed book plates. It's yes. so cool. So order a book. If you haven't already order, I think the books make the best gifts ever. So you've got, you know, your mom's birthday, your kid's birthday, your sister's birthday, your best friend who loves true crime, order a book, support this beautiful independent bookstore, and you can get a signed book plate. It makes an even better gift. Everybody, I'm telling you, it's the best gift. Order now for Christmas. Do it, do it, do it. It's going to be fabulous. Um, so we have some questions. Someone would like to know, Elise, are you in touch with anyone today for, still from the investigation? Tell us about that. Uh, well, I'm in touch with um, Pat's wife, his, it was his widow, Florence. Um, so I still stay in touch with her. And yes, um, it's funny you ask, Kathy Puckett, the profiler that I was just talking to you about, I'm actually interviewing her for the next book that I'm writing. What? Yeah, she, she wasn't involved in the investigation of this next subject. Um, but I just wrote to her and I said, I know, Kathy, that you weren't involved, but I'm sure that you have some impressions about dot, dot, dot. And she wrote back, she said, you know me too well, let's set up the interview. So I'm, I'm interviewing her in a couple of weeks. <laughs> She's oh, having her knee operated on, I think. So we're waiting until after her knee operation. But yeah, isn't that funny? That is funny. That is you funny. You never give up a good source. You keep going, even after the knee operation, okay, I'll give you a couple of days and then we're talking. <laughs> Listen, Kathy, recover fast. Recover. And I know you weren't on this case, but you must have some, you must have some thoughts about this person's mind and she said oh yes i do i do i was yes yep i i can't give too much away but she said oh i definitely have some opinions about 
the, These, yeah. You're teasing us mercilessly yes. about oh book God. number three in your hunting series. Yes. So we know you're interviewing your, F, your FBI profiler, Kathy Puckett, about the mental state of the person. Yes. Um, I know you can give nothing away because it's probably still a tender, nascent idea form. But are there any other tiny little t yummy tidbits you can share? I am uncovering. I mean, this is a historical book, just like Unabomber and Manson before. But I am uncovering so many mysteries. It's just, uh, it's shocking to me. And once again, I have found um, sources using my little federal key that are just being wonderful. I mean, uh, just amazing. And I'm just finding things that um, I didn't know that I would find going into this investigation. So I'm loving it. Oh my and gosh. Really, and it, it, this is absolutely relevant to today like now and coming up in the months and years ahead i'm already biting my nails i'm so excited yeah. i'm so excited i yeah. need that i need that lease wheel trademark legal expertise investigative journalism and digging up secrets that nobody else knows we've got to have it yeah at least we have another question so what did your family think about your choice of topics oh good question Oh, uh, well, my, you know, my dad's, uh, I, in fact, I asked my dad to help me uncover some sources for this, this book that I'm working on now. So my dad's sort of on speed dial, like dad, get into your book, because he's got the old FBI book with old agents and everything. Get into your book, see if you can find dot, dot, dot for me, you know, and I'll give him a name because I don't have access to that book. So he does. So dad's on speed dial for um, research appointments. And so, yeah, they're, they're all part of, they're part of it. <laughs> so they were on board. They were, they were not worried about you getting stuck down a dark path or they were cool. No, you compartmentalize, you know, as a, as growing up in law enforcement, I mean, I just, I grew up with, I grew up with this, you know, and it's, it's just, I grew up with one of my earliest memories is of my dad taking me to the FBI office and looking up and, you know, him showing me the wanted posters of the bad guys and saying, yeah, it takes, it takes really good men because they were all men at that point to hunt down these bad guys and just looking up, you know, up, at these pictures and going, okay, yeah, got to hunt the bad guys. And, you know, that's, that's sort of been instilled in me. And so I did it as a prosecutor and now I'm doing it as a journalist. Um, it's part of what we do as a family, I guess. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Again, you know, third generation federal prosecutor. Oh my God, Lisa, you're so amazing. And you're done being an FBI agent. Um, you know, it's, again, all of these things uniquely preparing you as you traversed your life's path thus far to, to be the teller of the story that no one else could really do the way that you, you have done. So this is amazing. Um, this is so cool. I'm loving every minute of this. Um, we have another question. What was the craziest case that you prosecuted in the U.S. Attorney's Office? Presumably, it paled in comparison to the Unabomber case. How do you bring your insights as a prosecutor to your writing? Ooh, I love that question. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, I, I, my specialty in, if you want to call it that, in the, in the U.S. Attorney's Office became murder for hire. <laughs> which is all, they're always very strange cases because mm -hmm. when, whenever you bring a third person into a murder, mm -hmm. it, it, it just becomes this weird, it, then it's just not the straight angle. Right. So I had this one guy, he was a um, Boeing engineer, and I just remember him saying, I have a five foot seven problem. And, you know, hiring this, this guy he thought was going to be uh, somebody to take rid of to get rid of this this problem, and coming to the meet with um, you know a beautifully engineered uh, device to stop his, his wife's car. I mean, if he'd spent the time, I mean, and all of these things organized. If he spent the time, you know, on you know, you know more uh, honorable pursuits, maybe you know. But this was like this guy had it all planned and organize and, and of course it was all with an fbi agent but i always found those cases and the victim was fine of course um 
uh, yeah, all my victims were fine in murder for hire cases. I, I got them all fine and safe. But just fascinating, you know, what it takes in that mindset to go to a whole other person that you don't know, to try to, you know, to kill another person. Um, it was just, you know, what kind of warp mentality would do that? And then the chase, you know, to get them before it happens and to construct a case, because you, you have to get them to do the things, not get them, but uh, let them go far enough to do the things that they're going to do to build a case so when you get them and you nab them, you have them on solicitation for murder enough to make them go away for 15, 20 years. Wow. So, very fascinating cases. That is fascinating. And it was funny because as I was reading this question, I had a funny feeling that it was my husband who was asking it and he just texted me to tell me it was his question. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he's also a lawyer. My, my victims were never victims. They were all <laughs> fine. I, my husband's also a lawyer and I could tell that there was a legal, there was a legally <laughs> informed tone to that. <laughs> Um, another question from the audience, growing up with law enforcement, how did you learn to not feel threatened and to feel safe with, while your father dealt with these bad guys? Yeah. Being a little girl, looking up at the posters, how, how come, how were you able to feel safe? Well, to me, when I was growing up, law enforcement was safe. You know, that was the emblem of safety. You know, they were, they were the good guys out there to protect. And, you know, it was the FBI, so it was federal law enforcement that I was dealing with. And when we were moving, we were dealing, my dad was moved from one place to another. Um, so they were always, you know, they, they, were, they were guys who were, you know, carrying weapons, um, but they were, you know, usually concealed. And it was, um, but they were emblematic of you know, trying to protect us. And then of course, when I got into being a federal prosecutor, it was always, we were the good guys trying to protect from, you know, the bad guys who were out there who are trying to do the murders and the violent crimes. I was in the violent crime section and mm -hmm. really trying to protect people from really, really, you know, bad, um, bad criminals out there. And that was so cut and dry. It was so black and white you know, in my core, that that's what I was doing. I was only trying to do the right thing. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking to see, you know, when you see bad cops, when you realize that's not how, you know, law enforcement is. That's for, for, some, for a lot of people. It's just heartbreaking when that happens. But that wasn't my experience when I grew up. I had a different experience. Yeah, and I think you're um, alluding to and touching on something that is certainly very, very timely and unfortunately timeless that we're addressing as a nation right now. For, as a nation. As a it's really, heartbreaking. Yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking for me to see that what my experience can be so different from somebody else's. And just because of the color of my skin, I mean, yeah. that's, that's so wrong. And it's, 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 in, it, it's enraging. Yeah. Uh, and I think you ask, you know, good cops, and they'll say the same thing. You ask good prosecutors, they'll say the same thing. Yeah. That's absolutely enraging, immoral, wrong on every single level, wrong just to the core of everything that a good prosecutor and a good cop believes. Exactly. And I think that as a nation, you know, we're starting to really to wrestle and reckon with it for in a very real, very deep way. And to acknowledge that part of our white privilege is to grow up feeling that the police right. are our protectors and to feel that when we're pulled over for speeding or whatever, that it's going to be okay. And that we're not going to get, you know, shot or, or no you know, anything, and that is part of our white privilege, and to Absolutely. have to acknowledge that, and then to put ourselves in, in the, um, to imagine that it's, to acknowledge that it's not like that for everybody, and to acknowledge that for many, many, many of our beloved black brothers and sisters, it's the opposite of yeah. that. They have grown up in fear of police, and having to culturally and familially instill techniques and tactics to hands up, and, you know, be extra careful. It's not fair, and it's, um, very painful nope. work that we're all addressing that's so important. It's very important. I mean, the idea that, you know, that mothers have to have conversations that you just alluded to, as opposed to, you know, hey, when a, when a police officer pulls you over, make sure you have your driver's license and show it. And yeah, that can be a little, 
scary just because you're worried you have to make sure all your papers are in order or did you speed or something like that. Um, that's much different from, oh my gosh, be, put your hands up because you might get shot. I mean, that's, that's a whole different conversation. And the fact that mothers have to have that conversation, it's wrong. It's wrong. And, and it's important that we're addressing it. It's interesting because actually um, my mentor growing up, um, who was one of my dearest friends, is actually an FBI agent. She's Native American. And I remember when I was, it was before I got my driver's license, but it was right before. So I was probably um, 17 or 18. I got my license late because I was a nervous Nelly. <laughs> um, I was a very anxiety ridden driver. Um, and I remember being in the car with her right before I got my license. And she turned to me and she said, if you ever get pulled over, put your hands up. Um, she said, because, you know, she, her being a law, being an FBI agent, she said, you don't know, we don't know when we're approaching a car, if you're reaching for your license or you're reaching for a gun. Right. That's so true. The time I was 17 years old. I knew if I ever got pulled over, I would put my hands up because she had told me that. And I thought if she's an FBI agent, she knew. Right. Um, and I right. do. Um, Cause you know, it's hard to be, you know, you don't know what people are reaching for. And it is, it's it's such a, an, an important conversation that we're having and right right so thank right. you for acknowledging it and bringing it up right um, and maybe by having these conversations and and by implementing changes much needed changes there can be built some more trust because there you know mo many most fbi agents go into it because they do want to help people and they do want to do the right thing and they do want to catch the bad guys and all of that is true you know, that's really true. And so I don't, I hope that, you know, I don't, I want I don't want them to not go into it or not, you know, not be so dispirited for uh, not even going into the FBI or going into the police force because they just feel like there's no reason to even go in anymore. I don't want that to happen. So there's got to be some way we can kind of try to figure this out through this great conversation that we're having now. And changes need to be made. Changes need to be made. Exactly. Um, I want to go back to something that you said, the murder for hire cases that you dealt with as a federal prosecutor. Um, so I had never really honestly given much thought because I'm not hiring any murderers <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yet. Um, I just was wondering, so how, you were saying, how <laughs> yeah, my husband better stay on my good side with those good <laughs> questions. I said he better ask some good questions and so far he's living up to it. Um, when you said that you, um, you have to let them get far enough down the path that you have that you have enough to to prosecute the case um how are you generally finding out about these murder for hire cases uh let me think okay uh one of them interestingly enough came to the came to a reporter um and the reporter came to the fbi yeah one of them wow. yes it was so fascinating a uh, one gentleman had actually burned down the house of somebody who wanted to kill um, the ex-boyfriend and her girlfriend and the and the and the and the son if he happened to be there, but definitely the ex-boyfriend. And she said, "Well, you know, just start with arson." So the guy that she'd hired did the arson, right? He was fine with doing the arson and got paid for the arson. But then she said, well, I want you to move on to doing a killing of the, my ex-boyfriend because I really don't like this ex-boyfriend. And uh, he said, he got nervous about the killing, but he didn't know where to go because he was, he was a felon. Yeah. And he said, I can't go to the FBI. I can't go to the police. And, you know, they're not going to believe me. And I'm a felon. I'm an ex-felon. <laughs> yeah, ex-con. And, uh, and I'm going to get in more trouble. And plus, I just did this arson. You know, yeah, just burn the place down. Yeah, and I just burned this place down. So he went to a reporter to see maybe she could go to the FBI and maybe tell about the woman or just do something to help him. So the reporter went to the FBI. The FBI then said, we want to bring her to the grand jury to get the guy so we can get a search, so we can go pick him up. So, of course, you can't just plop in a reporter, as you know, into the grand jury to give up a source. We didn't have the source yet. We, he, she wouldn't tell us who he was. So we had to go to D.C. and get a, you know, which is a pain in the rear whenever you have to go to headquarters. So I had to go to D.C. and got the warrants I needed, put the reporter on the stand. She was not happy with me no. and had to have her cough. But she did cough up the source on, in the grand jury. The second I had the source in the grand jury, the minute the source came out of her mouth, 
I had agents positioned in different places in the state. Closest one to the where this person was nabbed him and we grilled him like heck and we had him turn. And so I had him turn and set up a, a meeting in a hotel with the uh, person this happened to be a beautiful woman who was setting up her ex-boyfriend. She arrives with a beautiful handmade, uh, homemade, excuse me, casserole for the guy, the, ki the killer, and the uh, uh, semi-automatic, and money, and this casserole. <laughs> so she, she, the, I have this scene where I'm on, you know, I'm looking in the van, I'm in the van with the, with the guys, and we're about to, you know, looking in the hotel, and she's, oh, I've got this homemade casserole, and here's this automatic, and here's the money, and here's the, here's the place where she's going to be. And it, yeah, and if you want to kill the boy and the, and the girlfriend when they get there, that's fine. Just make it look like a robbery. And here is, cut into this pasta. It was a pasta casserole. And cut into it. It's still warm. Oh, and I'm my like, God. This is just so weird. <laughs> Oh my God, this is, every time I think it just can't get any weirder, it does. I can't believe it. My first thought is, is she trying to poison him? No, she wants to keep him alive. No, no, she wants him to live and be all fit and healthy, so he can do this. So we let her do a couple other things, but that was like, that was, she was pretty much toast after that. Yeah, I mean, um, you want him to feel, you want him to eat his Wheaties so he's energized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're all nice and strong, and she had the money, and she had the, uh, she had the place where he's supposed to do it, and they talked about how to do it, and yeah, you know, if he walks in with the girlfriend and the little boy, the little boy was nine years old at the time, oh, just kill him too, and just take a bunch of um, jewelry and stuff so it makes it look like a robbery, drug crime gone bad, but you know, it, but if he just walks in by himself, just kill him. That's fine. So it could be one or three people, you know, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> one person, three and person, three people. Oh, my whatever. God. At least this is crazy. This is crazy. I can't believe that one person has seen so much. This is amazing. Oh, my God. Thank you for telling us these stories, sharing uh, your knowledge and your experiences. This is fantastic. We have time for one more question from the audience. Here's your chance to ask New York Times bestselling author, Lise Real, author of 18 and now 19 books, federal prosecutor, legal expert for CNN, NPR, Fox. She's amazing. This is your chance. Ask her anything you want. Oh, Lise, this has been such a joy. Um, I just, I mean, I'm just, I feel so excited and energized from all of this fantastic. Oh, you're, you're great. I mean, you, you, you too. Your mystery that you're working on and, and all of the stuff that you're doing, it's great. Are you enjoying your, your mystery writing? I am. I am. Uh, I'm also, I'm also writing a true crime. So I think oh. I'm so fascinated by what, you know, what Mark Twain says is that truth is stranger than fiction. True. Um, yes. So I'm working on the unsolved murder of a woman in New York. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm six years into the research process. It took me a lot longer. I, I'm new to research and I'm new to law enforcement and I'm new into investigation. So it will be well, faster. I have found, um, for me at least, this is now I'm working on the third in the series in, the true, in this true crime series. True crime does take longer. The nonfiction does take longer than the fiction, um, at least for me, because with the, with the, the fiction, um, I think one of the questions earlier was, do I take the, what I've used in, in prosecution? And, and, and absolutely. I can take what's real, like the story I just told about the, the pasta and the, and the <laughs> woman, and I actually can put that into a story, right, and meld her character in a way, but use that in tidbits in, 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 a, in a story and call it fiction because I'm, I'm melding it into a different story with a different character and she's going to say different things. And it's fiction, even though I'm taking it from my knowledge of a certain case, because I'm meshing and mushing a lot of different things. With nonfiction, you have to stay on the straight and narrow and get it absolutely right. And yes. you'll see in the back of my book, I've got a sources, a methodology, I've got a timeline, I've got attributions. I mean, about pages and pages of sources of methodology, what I've done, my research. I mean, I was a law professor before I started on this, and I had to write for tenure. I had to write law review articles, and you have to, 
you know, you have to cite your navel in that. I mean, <laughs> anything, you know. I pick up an orange, okay? Where'd the orange come from? Well, I'm sort of, okay, where, you know, cite it. I mean, anything. So, and it's got to be right. And it should, and if it's not, you're going to get criticized and you should get criticized. So um, it's intense on the research. Um, and I tried myself in giving you something new in these books. And to get you something new, I've got to go deep dive into these sources so I can come up with these stories that are new and interesting and different that you're not going to get anywhere else. I, to me, I don't want to just tell you a story that you've heard before. I want to tell you the new story, like the, the, Unabomber, the Unabomber task force was almost shut down. I didn't know that before. I want to now tell you that story. Yeah. So, they, you don't do that by just doing a, sur a superficial little, oh, let's just glance at whatever's been out, written out there and let's see what Unabomber's you know, read, uh, written himself. You really have to do a deep dive several year investigation to get it. So um, it's, it's harder to me than fiction, I think. Thank you for saying that, because I was starting to feel like a loser. <laughs> um, yeah, feel, feel, give yourself a break. Give yourself a break. Lisa, we have one more question for you. This yes. person would like to know, where is, the, is, where is the best place to live to find crime stories? Is East Coast better than the Southwest or South? Tell us about that. You, you live in New York. You're from Connecticut. You're currently sheltering in place in Arizona. How does, where, tell us about that. Does oh, oh. location matter? You know, crime is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? I think just being observant is the best thing wherever you're planted. Because you could be in a small town and see wild things. You can imagine things in a small town. Um, or you can be in a big city and things are happening right in front of you. Um, so I don't know. I don't think location is all that important. Um, it's, I mean, scenery is important, obviously, and where you are in scenery is important. And you're in lovely Madison, all of you, right now, which I adore Madison, and I miss everybody in Madison, and I miss RJ Julia. Um, so, but I, I, when I was in Madison last summer, I was thinking, I want to, I want to write a mystery right here in Madison, because it's just, oh, it's just, it's just burning for a good murder mystery in Madison. But that's a whole other story. Okay, well, once you finish hunting number three, maybe you go to fiction in Madison, and we will eagerly, eagerly await all of that. Excellent. Um, I want to remind everyone that there are signed book plates available through RJ Julia. You can support this independent bookstore. Remember that voting is not something we do every four years. It is something you do with every purchase. You vote for the businesses that you want to see survive and thrive. You vote for the authors that you want to see get another book deal. You vote for the future and, and the world that you want to see. So please support independent bookstores. Support RJ Julia. Support Lee's with this great book and do yourself a favor and gift this book to whoever you give it to will thank you i want to thank everyone for being here i want to thank the amazing lise wheel you are pure Sarah, thank you thank you and thank you rj julia so much for having me and, and letting me be a little snippet of madison for a few minutes and seeing my friends and, and sarah thank you and kendra thank you so much and, and everybody at rj julia for extending your kindness and graciousness and having me here tonight i really appreciate it Yes, thank you, so thank you much. both. Thank you, Lise and Sarah. Um, that was absolutely amazing. It's been such a great pleasure. We love having you, and we're so excited, Lise, for your new book. Guys, girls, Hunting the Unabomber by Lise Wheel can be purchased in-store, yay, or online um, by going to rjjulia.com or RJ Julian and Wesleyan website, and those signed book plates are available. So that's awesome. Thank you all for being with us, for supporting our local independent bookstores, for supporting our amazing authors. It means the absolute world to us. Everyone, take care, happy reading, and have a great night. Oh, Lisa, I'm just getting a, a text from my friends in Australia and Brisbane. They're saying, bloody awesome. That's a terrible oh, Australian accent. Bloody, bloody awesome. awesome. Yay. You are fabulous. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much. What a pleasure and what an honor to. You were great. Um, Both of you guys, thank you. That was fun. It was so fun to chat with you and to hear all of that, all of those juicy behind the scenes. <laughs> live for this stuff <laughs> it's it's fun i mean it, you know what and honestly having been sheltered in place here it's been it's been really nice to have my work both with uh unabomber coming out and being able to do zoom events and be, you know be talking with laura and doing pr stuff and getting ready and getting excited and then being able to focus on the new book too and doing getting into the interviews because i don't know what i would do without my work you know True. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, crazy. It'd be tough. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good time to have something to focus on. And boy, are your topics focus driven. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Thrilling, thrilling life. I have to say, I, I mean, are you just, do you find yourself shocked when you are researching or are you to the point where just nothing is off the table that it's just the, the abnormal is the norm now? I, I, I get nervous every time, like when I started this new book and we decided on the subject, I thought, okay, really interesting, but it's historical. What am I going to find that's new? Like, how am I going to, how am I going to get into this? How am I going to tap this? <laughs> and it's like in the last six weeks through, um, some, it, things I wouldn't have known that that's how it would come about. I have, and it's, and I've like weirdly, and it's, it's like, oh my gosh, this is great. Yeah. This is great. Now, how do I put this together to tell the story? You know, now that's the next, like, ah, you know? okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. That was amazing. And we can absolutely send you guys the link to the recording and yes. Erica will edit out like this ending portion and the portion at the, the <laughs> top of it so that you just have the actual event that you can share it. Right. I'll put it on. Yeah. I know that Laura's going to want to do her magic and put it on Facebook and everything. You got it. And Isn't I'll it? share it to all my channels as well. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Perfect. Yeah. And yes. keep us informed for what you both have coming. I mean, hopefully we're able to invite authors back to the store soon because we miss you guys and we miss having the events in person. So fingers crossed. We miss uh, you too. <laughs> yeah, but I'm so glad you guys are doing this. It's just great. And, and thank, I really feel honored that you invited me. I mean, I'm just like, RJ Julia, yes! Oh, good. Yeah, it's been, it's been a ride. But with everything going on, Technology has been a blessing so that we can see. Really? Well, well I, am, I am telling you that um, one of the main reasons that I decided to, to live in Madison, at least part time, and I was hoping to maybe somebody live there full time, it's just kind of like a, you know, it's everything's up in the air right now, was the bookstore because it told me so much about the people and the town that it, that it would sustain such a wonderful bookstore. This must be a special town to have such a great bookstore and great library that yeah. this must be a really special place. And of course, then I started meeting people and it was like, yes, I was right. But it was the bookstore. Seriously. I'm like, ah, okay, this is the, I'm on to something here in this little Madison place. I got, I'm on to ya. <laughs> I gotta get you back over here. No, it's a fantastic community. I'm yeah. You guys need to use that as a blurb for your bookstore. Put that on the homepage. Yeah. yeah seriously. Yeah. Seriously. It's like, I'm a detective. And I figured <laughs> something about this town. Yeah. <laughs> I always send Erica a little note after the event, so I will make note of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe in one of your books, you could mention the bookstore as a place where you were sleuthing. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I seriously was, I was seriously, in fact, I was talking to Annette Healy, who was on the, on the chat today. Um, we were trying to figure, we were, we were discussing some Madison mysteries last summer, because you do have some. Yeah. And yeah, we were, we were tracking down some people, we were looking at some mysteries, actually, and trying to get some old uh, cops to try to talk to me and stuff. I'm not, I'm totally, I'm, uh, absolutely, 100% not kidding. Oh my God. Yeah. That's so cool. I yeah. know. I just can't be there right now. But this will.